Well, hey, everybody, I'm here with my friend, Patrick Alcantara. You may know him as Patrick Alcantara or Patrick Alcantara. The anointing of the Spirit on this man's life is profound. Uh, Patrick started coming uh, to the church six years ago, the first time we held a service at the other side. How many people were around for the other side? Amen. I remember I saw Pat walk in, and he's wearing a, a little revealing shirt, and I could see his tattoo. And uh, I just have a rule. If, if anyone is ever tattooed, I, always, I, I like to talk to those people. So I'm like, i got to talk to this guy. He looks pretty cool. And, and we got to know each other, and... One of the most in incredible moments, um, I mean, I mean, as a spirit-filled believer for me, happened with Patrick. One day, Patrick and his wife Ariel they came to our house, and, and we were praying for Patrick to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Patrick was hungry for the Spirit of God. He he knew the Word of God. He saw it, and he wanted it. And the Holy Spirit came upon Patrick with a power that I had never seen before. Uh, we've prayed for hundreds and hundreds of people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit came on him with such a power that they left and it felt as though a wind was blowing through my house. I, I'm not a hyper charismatic, but I've never experienced that type of manifestation of the spirit before. It felt like the windows were open and the spirit was blowing through our house. My wife and I were laying on our floor in our living room just being washed over by the Ruach of God. This is how the Ruach manifests on this man's life. And I am so thankful and grateful for his family and getting to be a part of this ministry together. Oh man. <laughs> oh, I can't let I can't let this brother of mine give thanks to me without me giving it back. Uh, Nick and Danielle literally changed the trajectory of our marriage and our family ultimately. We were directionless. You know, we didn't our aim was off and they came alongside uh, through many Man, I, I, I remember with Nick, he was just relentless in his pursuit of me. You know, I, uh, I struggle sometimes with, with trusting and with trusting men specifically. Uh, but Nick Massey's constant pursuit, even when I pushed him away, it was life-altering and life-changing for our family. And that's, that, you surround yourself with men and women like the Massey family, it'll, it'll do well for you. It'll do well for you. All right, so we're talking about oaths and irreducible minimums. We're on point four. Point four. Does anyone have it in their Bible? Yeah, I do. Let's go ahead and read it. A promise made to the group is a vow, a pledge before my God, and therefore it is not optional and cannot be renegotiated or annulled. My word is my bond and can be trusted. It is in writing. You guys know that your word, when you gave your word, it used to be binding, like a contract. Just like signing and dating a contract. That's the idea of when you give your word to someone, that it's in writing, that is binding. And so we're talking about a promise made to the group is a vow. We didn't want to come up here and uh, have it turn into a, a point fest of, hey, you didn't, you, you didn't hold to your word. Oh, hey, you broke your word. This person broke their word. That's not our goal today. Our goal is to look on ourself, ownership, that this is my vow. This is my vow to the group, that it can be trusted. And why can it be trusted? It's because we serve a God who can be trusted, right? In Isaiah 55, 11, it says, when his word goes out, it does not return empty, but it accomplishes everything that it's purposed, right? 
Let's turn to 1 John 2, verses 4 through 6. It says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. The reason we can trust our God is because he doesn't break his word. He holds to his promises the things that he speaks out comes to pass. So if we are to abide and walk just like him, man, we need to be people of our word. We need to be trusted to our brothers. And we're going to talk about that. How amazing is it that in Hebrews 1, 3, it says that the universe, the universe is upheld by the power of his word. That these things, everything around us is held together by the power of our God's word. Now, what we could preach for weeks about God's word, what we're focusing today on is your word. Like Patrick said, it is so easy to walk through something like this and think of all the times someone didn't do what they said they would do. How many people have ever experienced that? Someone says they would do something. Okay, we've all experienced it. What about you? The word that you have given. Son, when I'm done with this project, then we will go do this and that this never happens. Wife, I feel convicted to lead you through the word in a more tangible, direct way. Then that never happens. What we're talking about is being hyper-focused on ourselves and looking into our own life to say, God, number one, I want to forgive those who have broken their word, and God, I want to get it right and make things right where I have broken my word because that's what will purify our hearts. The scripture that we have comes out of Numbers 30, 1 through 2. Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes, the heads of the families. Any leaders of families in here? He spoke to them, saying, this is what the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not, what's the next word? Break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Think about that for a second. Think of everything even this morning that has proceeded out of your mouth. Do you feel the weight of that? That we are to perform these things, these covenants, these vows, first and foremost between us and the Lord and us and each other. The title of today's message is Broken Word. Broken Words. The word here for break his word, this this phrase is halal. It means to wound, either physically unto death or to mortally wound. Or figuratively, It's to wound unto despair. Did you know that broken words can lead us to a place relationally where they cause mortal wounds in our relationships? They can cause mortal wounds in our families. They can cause mortal wounds unto despair. Now, if you're thinking, oh, my gosh, is is everything beyond repair? The answer is no, because our God resurrects from the dead. There are dead relationships, relationships that have experienced mortal wounds in here because of breaking of word. Maybe it's been infidelity in a marriage. You made a covenant. I will, I will. You are mine. I am yours. And that word was broken. The Lord wants to resurrect that today. Between sons and fathers, between friends, 
But this is what the scripture paints for us, what happens when our word is broken. One of the best definitions it gives for this breaking of the word, and, and, and this, is, this is pretty special. It's making a vineyard common. I'll explain. Deuteronomy 20 verse 6 says, And if there any man who has planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed its fruit, let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man enjoy its fruit. When you speak something out, when you make a promise, when you make a covenant, God wants to bring fruitfulness into your life through acting on and accomplishing the covenant you've spoken out. It's like a vineyard. When you speak something out, I will do this. Uh, this is my vow to you. I, th this is what, what I am doing. It paints this picture that that is like a vineyard being planted. When you do what you say you will do, it is as though you are coming into a vineyard tasting of the glorious fruit. The Lord wants you to taste of the fruit of doing your word. I, I, I had a time where the Lord was checking me the last three weeks about laziness and apathy and my own spiritual fervor with how I led my wife in the scriptures. So we had to change it. We had to begin, we started reading through the Psalms together and started praying more intentionally together. And already we are tasting of the fruit of that word being done. Do you see how this works? The Lord wants us to have a feast today because our words matter. Yeah, we're talking about keeping our word, not breaking our word. And so from the foundation where we need to realize is that our words matter. You know, do you guys realize that your words matter? That what you speak matters? That there's life and death in the tongue? You know, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm even here right now, honestly, is because my brother Massey, time after time after time, was speaking life over me, right? And I've tasted the fruit of the life-giving speech that he's constantly poured out on me. Can I hit something real? I don't know, I just feel led to, to uh, speak frankly. Um, no, don't, Pat, that's too much for us, no. I want to speak directly to the people who, who don't believe that their voice matters. That's a lie from the enemy. You know, I relate so, so closely to that. That what I have to say doesn't matter. That I have nothing to offer. I just feel like the, does anyone resonate? Has anyone resonated with that? That you feel like your voice doesn't matter? You don't know what you're talking about. People are going to look at you wrong. I relate so closely to Jeremiah's calling where he's, uh, he's called and the Lord said, uh, he, he anointed him as a prophet. And Jeremiah says, I don't even know how to speak, Lord. And the Lord says, you don't need to worry about that. I'm going to touch your mouth and I'm going to put my words in your mouth. Right? So those that believe that your word doesn't matter, I guess in a sense in your flesh it doesn't. But as a new creation in Christ, Allow the Lord to put his words in your mouth. In Deuteronomy 23, 21, it says, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. Right? So what this is saying, that the Lord requires something of us when we speak, when we give words. They need to be trusted and they need to be fulfilled without delay. Amen. Uh, believers were never meant to be voiceless. Our God speaks and things change. And if we're to be like Christ, like God in these ways, when we speak, there should be life that produces from it. I'm sure you guys have heard of the saying that a boat in a harbor is safe, but that's not what a boat is made for. 
we weren't made to be voiceless. We need to speak, and we need to realize that our words hold weight. Your words matter. Now, there's two parts of this. We're told through the scriptures that we need to let our yes be yes and our no be no, right? So when, we're, when we say that we're making a vow, we're giving a yes to something or we're giving a no to something. And the first part that we have to think about is what you say yes to, you must do. That's what we're talking about, okay? Now, on the flip side, there are people here who you don't say yes or no to anything. You don't say yes or no to anything. You're always in the middle. Everything is a maybe. Hey, brother, can, can this happen? Well, maybe. We'll see. Oh. I, I don't know, may, what are you doing? Would you like to come over? I don't know, maybe. The Lord has to transform some people in here to actually make commitments to demonstrate their love for their family. So don't just take this as do what you said you're going to do, but some of you have to start saying stuff that you're going to do. Okay, last week we talked about uh, th- this, this value that we have. It, it's not a prove-it-to-me system. And this is the expression of putting our brother's needs above our own. Everything hinges on this. If we don't do what we say, if we don't even say anything, everything else will fall apart. If, if our words cannot be trusted, then they can't be trusted. The Lord is making us strong and steady that this could be a foundational pillar in our relationships with one another. All right, Matthew 12. We're gonna, this is just the intro. You thought last week was long? Okay, get ready for this week. Yeah, Dan, you should cancel your plans for Friday night, okay, because, oh, that's the feast. We'll do that. Uh, Matthew 12, 33 through 37. I, just, I, I want you to hear this, and we're going to jump into our main text for today, okay? Is everybody with me? We'll start in verse... 36, Jesus gets done rebuking the Pharisees, he calls them a brood of vipers. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Every careless, the word in Greek here is rhema. Anyone know the word rhema? Have you studied that before? It's like this, it, it really, it heavily carries the connotation of spoken word. Not always, but often we see that. Everyone will give account for every careless word they speak. Now, I want to take a a little pressure off of you. Because the judgment that Jesus is talking about isn't the judgment for those who have a genuine relationship with him. This is a judgment that's coming for those who do not believe in him. But there's a principle that we have to pull from this. Here it is. It says... By your words, logos, different word for word, you will be justified. And by your words, logos, you will be condemned. So what does that mean? He's talking about speaking the word that you're going to be judged by what you speak, and then you're going to be judged by the logos, which means written word. What does that actually look like? Let me give you two scriptures. In Romans 10, 9, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There is a confession part of our faith. Logos, written word. What, what, what is that talking about? I believe that this is pointing back to Jeremiah 31, 33 where it says, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within you and I will write it on their hearts. When your heart is transformed, you have the very written word of God by his hand, Jesus Christ, on your heart. And you will be judged according to if he is written on your heart as your Lord and your Savior. These words matter. The main text we're going to look at, and you can flip there now, is Genesis 29 through 31. If you like to write out main points, maybe the the big idea, this is it. That broken words fracture families. Broken words, when we break our words, we just read about what they do. They fracture 
families. They split families. Did you know that the family of God is meant to be like a solid rock? We're meant to be one. We're meant to be whole. But when we break our words, the fruit that flows through that causes fractures in families. How many people have a fractured family in some sense because of broken words? It's like this. I I have a picture in a video of of stone splitting. Have you ever seen someone split a rock before? You, You have to drill a hole. Then you place these things. You see the flat things on top of the rock. Those are called feathers. And then you have a wedge that you drive down into the feathers. And what it does, these feathers spread the rock apart and they create a split. I think we have a video of that too. Come on, look at that guy. He's like, I did it. I did it. I was going to make a joke. The reason why he was able to actually make that happen is because he wasn't white and he had a good work ethic. But (laughs) it's it's funny. It's all right. Think about this. It was a joke. Calm down. White people have good work ethics every now and then, too. You just got to train them up in it. We got to father people into it. Okay. <laughs> I love the Brad's loving that in the back. Okay. So think about this. I mean, that was pretty impressive. These little wedges splitting this massive rock. How many people didn't think it was going to split? Be real. Yeah. We, ben thought we were going to be here for a while. So many times this can be our mentality. Oh, it's just a word. It's just, I I just broke this little thing. But as that gets hit over and over and over and over again, which has happened in so many of our lives, all of a sudden the fracture comes. We're going to look at, through the word of God, through Genesis 29 through 31 today, about the story of Jacob and Laban. How these wedges of broken words were wedged and smashed into the relationship that caused a fracture. Are you guys ready to get in God's word? In Genesis, we're going to kick back. Genesis 28, verse 2, it says... Arise, go to Padam Aram, this means plateau, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brothers. So we see that Jacob is given a purpose, he's given a call, he has a destination he needs to go to, and this is on the back of some pretty messed up stuff that happened. Remember the whole Jacob and Esau thing? Played a little trick on him. So Jacob isn't leaving uh, the house in in the best order because Esau is pretty upset and wants to kill him. Yeah, so like Pastor Massey is talking about, Jacob is fleeing from his hometown uh, in Beersheba. He's going to Padan Aram, this picture of a plateau. And we're going to see how relationally how it plateaus as well. And so the distance between Beersheba and Haran is about 500 miles. The city of Haran is in Padan Aram. And so I can only imagine Jacob, you know, his brother Esau was a hunter. He would go out and leave his home. Jacob said he was a man of the tents. So he was a homebody. He was a mama's boy in a sense with, uh, with Rebecca. Uh, so I can only imagine him by foot traveling for 500 miles trying to find family. He was told to go find his uncle, Laban. And this is where we, where we are in uh, chapter 29. 
So I'm just going to summarize it for you pretty much. So Jacob is uh, traveling. He comes to a well, and there are shepherds there watering their flock. And Jacob goes and asks the shepherds, where are you from? And they say, we're from Haran. And they said, and Jacob said, oh, do you know Laban? And he's like, yeah, we know Laban. Actually, that's his daughter, Rachel, coming with, uh, with her flock. She was a shepherdess. And so, come on, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> she, she was more out there than Jacob was, right? She was, like, out there with the sheep having to fend off animals, and Jacob's like kind of like prancing around the house a little bit. <laughs> That's the way I see it, at least. Go, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry, Pat. Yeah. No, 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 you're good. I you're should good. probably watch my mouth. I'm already getting in trouble, so we'll. So interestingly enough, Jacob sees Rachel, and before even speaking to her, he goes and he kisses her. I just want. Bold. I'd implore the young single men here not to do that. Yeah. Finding an attractive yes. woman and just going and not kissing before talking to her. Yeah. But no, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a romantic kiss. Imagine Jacob for 500 miles tracking by foot, trying to go find his family, and so it's this embracing this this embracing kiss. Oh, I found who I'm looking for, right? And so let's uh, let's look in Genesis 29, 13 through 14. So Rachel goes back to Laban and says, hey, I found Jacob. In 13, it says, as soon as, Laban heard, as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him. See, kissing again. There's this embracing family. And he brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. So we get a picture here of family. Man, how many of you walked into this body and just felt the embrace of what a family is? Maybe you didn't grow up in a family, but, man, I can speak of experience. Uh, when I walked into the Arising for the first time, I got to taste what family was in a, in a new way. I, I grew up in an amazing family, but the, the body of Christ is amazing. So what Laban is doing here is a good thing. He's embracing Jacob. He's bringing, him, he's bringing him near. We don't know if his intentions are, are, are right or not. It seems like they are good. Uh, but we have him bringing Jacob in close. So we see that. He's like, you're my family. Jacob, no, we're family here. We're family. This sets up the stage for why the hurt is so severe. Many times the greatest level of pain we experience is with our family, with our physical family, with our church family. This is not a foreign concept to the scriptures. But maybe you've been hurt by your family, by your church family, by your, your natural born family. Have an open heart and just ask the Lord to resurrect it. He doesn't even just say, hey, your family. But Laban tries to bless him. Look at verse 15. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman. Hey, we're family. Should you therefore serve me for nothing? He's like, hey, man, I, I know we're family, but you deserve to be paid. Tell me, what shall your wages be? Before we get to what his wages shall be, we have to see the picture that's being drawn. Brother, you are family to us. Not only did he bring them into a family, but he began to employ him. Has anyone ever struggled through the family of God employment relationship? This is what's happening right now in this. People are laughing because it's so true. <laughs> so now you have family who's employed, but wedges begin to be struck into the rock of family. So we're going to look at the first wedge, that when we break our word, it's like this wedge that's getting slammed into that rock. 
So let's look in verse 16 through 19. So Laban asked him, what should my wages be? It says, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So our first wedge is vague agreements. Vague agreements. You catch what happens here. Jacob is asking for his daughter, and he presents what his way should be. He says, I'm going to serve you for seven years. And in 19, what, is, what does Laban say? He says, it is, be, it is better that I give her to you than I should, that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. Is he clear in what he's agreeing to? Is he saying, yes, this is the, 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 the outline, this is how it's going to go. You will receive Rachel. He more or less says, yeah, it's, it is better that I give it to you than I give it to any other man. That's a vague agreement. And if we're, if we're honest, this uh, vague agreement can easily be found within, within, within families. I, uh, who is, uh, who's ever purchased anything on Facebook Marketplace? Yes. Man, if, that's, if there's any other picture of uh, vague agreements. Just real quick, Pat. People were like fist pounding to buying things on Facebook Marketplace. We may have another issue we got to preach on in about three minutes. So one time uh, I was looking for a vehicle, and I, uh, I found a car on Facebook Marketplace. Nice, dude. And so I, uh, <laughs> my dad picks me up, and him and my wife. I want to give a shout-out to my dad. If you, if you don't know, my, my dad's here. Yes. If you, uh, if you want to hear a testimony of God's faithfulness, talk to my dad. And also my wife's parents are here as well. Hallelujah. Man, 50 plus years of people keeping their word and their vow. I'm blessed by having parents that uh, are still together and are choosing to stay together. Where are we at? Oh, yes, yes. So I go. I'm talking to this guy. He says, uh, you know, we're talking about payment. He's like, cash or check. I'm like, he's like, cash. I'm like, okay. I go to the bank. I take out cash. He's like an hour and a half away towards the city. And uh, so I, I, we make the trek out that way. Unbeknownst to me, it was a vague agreement. I get five minutes from picking up this car. I get a text from the guy. He says, oh, sorry, I sold the car. And I'm sitting here in traffic on 90 with all this cash. Nice. Vague agreement. Vague agreement. That's like, uh, and that's just in the world. These vague agreements can happen within our family here as well. And what it does is it creates this unknowingly false trust in that person that you're making that agreement to, an agreement with. I know I'm not alone in doing this. Who else can, uh, who else knows that, uh, or who else has done, done this? Guilty. Uh, thank you for pointing at me. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After church, there's going to be many conversations of people coming together. And they're going to be talking about, oh, hey, we should grab lunch sometime. We should make, we should get coffee. We should, we should connect. Yeah, man, that'd be great. Let me know. How many have done that and it never happens? That's a vague agreement. In the little things like that, that, that that's creating this, this wedge. Do you guys see that? How that can be a wedge in the trusting of your relationship as a body? We're called to be one body. Not divided in any way. Most of the times this comes in when somebody actually needs help. I need this some sort of help. I need physical help. I need marital help. I need uh, perspective help. And you agree to being some sort of help but in a vague way. And then these expectations are built up because one person thinks you meant this. You are kind of half committed so you 
you think it could be okay if it looked like this. And then when you come together, there is a, a, a fracture that begins to form in your relationship. Have you experienced that? Vague agreements. When, when we're helping each other, when we're talking with each other, it, it, you have to be as plain as you can with your speech. Hey, can, can you help and do this? I don't know if I can. I want to help and do this, but I will get back to you at this time and let you know a yes or a no. That will save so many unnecessary relational uh, splits as we navigate through being one body together. This is just super practical. We have to get very good at not masking our words to try to make people feel better about us being available or not, but we have to be plain. This is where it starts. It doesn't seem like a big thing, having a vague commitment. Uh, hey, are you going to the feast? Uh, yeah, maybe. I, I, I'm planning on being there. Vague. Hey, are you going to the feast? I really don't want to be outside, and so if my courage can rise up to the point where I want to be outside for that long, then I'll come. Oh, okay, cool. Can you imagine if we all just were very honest with what was in our heart to that degree? And then we could just work through those things together. My goodness, the depth of relationships we would have with one another. So if you're thinking right now, yeah, I've made a few vague agreements. Take out your phone, take out a piece of paper, write those down and make them concrete, make them solid. A yes or a no. If you're processing through it, let the person know I'm processing through it. This is when I will get back to you. Can we get that practical? I guarantee this is going to fix a lot of things if we can just get this. So we know we're not going to go into the details of all these stories because we really want to hit on this broken part, okay, this, this broken word part. So look at verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him, I love this, but they seemed to him but a few days. Because of the love he had for her. I love it. Then Jacob, uh, this is also amazing. So you thought Jacob was sweet. Now let's get to the real part. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. He's like, they felt but days. Now I want to have sex with my wife. Brutal honesty. So Laban So Laban gathered together all the people of the place, and he made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. What? And Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? There are many places we could go with why that exchange happened with Lee and Rachel. Did Jacob know about it? Was Jacob making a compromise and settling for something that was other than God's plan in a moment? Per perhaps he was. But this is what we want to hang on to. Laban said, get this phrase, because we do this. It is not done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Laban, why did you do this to me? Oh, Jacob, it's not done that way around here. I want to explain another wedge, and this is what we titled it. Hidden house rules. We have hidden house rules. I have hidden house rules. When I play horse with my kids and I'm losing, all of a sudden I activate a house rule. And, oh, yeah, by the way, the, if you miss your last shot, you actually get two more chances at it. It's, it's like grace, God. Right, boys? Okay. A hidden house rule. Have you ever walked in? I, I grew up with a, with a Chicago Italian family. You, you ever walk into a house with your shoes on in a Chicago Italian family's house? You immediately know you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. 
You're like, I feel that everyone wants to kill me, but I don't know why. <laughs> oh, bro, it's because you're wearing the shoes in the house. You, you don't do that in Italian families. But there's a hidden house rule. I want you to read this definition of a hidden house rule. It's when you implement unknown or unspoken standards to justify breaking our word. That's exactly what Laban did. He implemented an unspoken standard that they had at their house to justify him breaking his word. A rule that applies only among a certain group or in a certain time. We do this quite a bit. When we are confronted with the fact that we broke our word, that we didn't do what we said we would do, we make all kinds of excuses. Well, the reason I did that, or don't you know I had to do this thing before your thing. Didn't you know that? I told you there was a job I had to finish up. Vague agreement. I did this because I won't let people get the best of me. I want you to imagine this, Dan, you're sitting up front and Peter. I want you to imagine Peter gave Dan his word that he would help him fix his car. We're going to get really simple. He said, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Around this time, uh, Dan, I, I'll be there. And Dan's like, I need a car. i got to get to work. i got all these things to do. He's counting on Peter to do what he said he would do. Well, the time comes, Dan's checking his watch. There's no Peter. He calls Peter. Peter doesn't answer. He waits around. A couple hours go by. And then Peter finally calls him back. Dan, hey, I, I'm sorry, but you know I, I, I have to make sure my things at my house are good first, right? It's a godly thing. But the issue is that it is used as an excuse for us breaking what we said we would do. We don't want to use a seemingly godly situation. I'm very well sure this must have been a, a thing that was being done in this culture, that the first get married, whether that's true or not. We have to stop making excuses, coming up with some spiritual reason why we did what we did to give us a, a, an excuse or a pass for breaking our word. This is a house rule. We throw around vernacular. We'll, we'll, oh, buddy, oh, man, I, I, I did that because of this. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? That you can make up house rules so that things seem more spiritual for the reason why you didn't stick to your word. House rules. Are you guys seeing the progression here? How it started out with this vague agreement that was made. And when it, once Laban was confronted in that vague agreement that he chalked it up to this house made rule uh, that Massey's talking about here. Wedge. Hammered in time after time. We're going to look at another, another wedge that comes in the progression here of the story. It's in Genesis 29, 27 through 30. So Laban said, house made rule. This is not done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Verse 27, complete the week of this one and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. All right, so our next wedge is self-serving solutions. Self-serving solutions. This comes down to just selfishness, selfish ambition. In James 3.16, it says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Disorder in the family. This is what we're seeing play out in Laban and Jacob's life. They're a family, but we're seeing disorder. 
through a selfish ambition uh, heart that Laban is uh, showing. And this comes, this honestly goes back to point number three from last week in Philippians, putting my brother's need before my own. He's seeing not just what he can uh, help his brother in, but he's trying to get, he's seeking gain from his, from his brother's expense. You guys see how he does that? Well, he's saying, hey, if you work for me another seven years, then I'll give you Rachel. He already committed and served the wages that he had asked Laban of in the first place, seven years. Laban asked for seven more because he's, I mean, he's using Jacob here. And uh, this is just interesting. I don't know. I was just thinking about this. Jacob was in real need. He came to Haran with nothing. He was told to go find a wife. And we know that through Jacob comes the 12 sons that are the heads of the tribes of of the nation of Israel. And... uh, He's got, he's got a real need. He's got some work to do. He's trying to find a wife. And Laban is uh, backpedaling and, and, and not adhering to the agreement that he has. That's a very good word, backpedaling. Have you ever had to backpedal on words? Maybe you express something in a moment and then someone latches onto that. They grab hold of that and then they bring it back up to you. And then all of a sudden you start backpedaling a little bit. Well, well, you must have misunderstood what I meant. What I meant was this, and then we change it. When I was, uh, when I was in high school in 2007, I went to Zambia. Beautiful country. I love Zambia. And the, lead, <laughs> the leaders of our trip, uh, they, they took like 15 of us. And so it was, it was a kind of a, a big group, but we all went, and the leaders sat us down before we went, and they said, whatever you do, do not promise these people that you will be back. Don't do it. Don't promise, because this is important to us. What do you think I did? <laughs> so, you know, you're going there, you're getting a little excited, you're with the people, you're, you're, your heart's being all welled up inside of you, and you feel connected to the relationships that you're building. And myself and my two other friends who were on this trip, we, I remember we were talking to the pastor, and all of a sudden that phrase was going through our minds, don't promise him that you'll be back. Don't promise him you'll be back. Don't promise him you'll be back. But we thought, we're different. Everyone else might have said that, but we're going to say it, and we're going to mean it. Have I ever been back to Zambia, Pastor Slaughter? No. <laughs> no. But we made this promise, we made this commitment, and then all of a sudden we walked away being like, what did I just do? And we had to go back and we had to backpedal away from what we committed to. We got to stop this. Our word is our bond. It can be trusted. I want to remind you, this has nothing to do with what people have said to you. This is what you do with what you have spoken to other people. So what happens, uh, Jacob, he begins to have all these children. We're not going to go through that. But look at chapter 30, verse 25. We're going to read a chunk here. It says, as soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I might go to my own, my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for which I have served you, that I may go. For you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination. Good or bad? That's bad. That the Lord has blessed me because of you. Something amazing that we can follow through this, obviously divination isn't good. It is not godly. And yet Jacob doesn't hold that as a point of contention for doing what he's said he would do. How many times do you find yourself in a situation where someone does something ungodly so you use as an excuse to break your word toward them? Well, what you're doing is ungodly, so therefore I'm out. That's not the, sat, the pattern we see in the word. 
Let's keep going. But Laban said to him, uh, we read that already. Okay, verse 28. Name your wages and I will give it. Hmm, suspect. Jacob said to him, you yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it was increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If, if you will not do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for, for me later. Do you see how Jacob is fighting to be a man of integrity even in light of the sin that's been going on around him. We can't use someone else's sin as an excuse to walk into sin ourselves. When you come to look into my wages with you, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Very clear. No vagueness in that. Laban said... Good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black. And he put them in charge of his sons and he set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob. Self-serving solution. Imagine this. So Laban now, he agrees. Yeah, I'll let, I'll, I'll let that be your wages. Sure. But selfish ambition and gain take over. And he takes the very thing that he promised and he gave it to his sons. What does this mean for us? I think sometimes we claim lack in a certain area so that we remove ourselves from having to meet other people's needs. Let's think of a very basic example, financially. We come in, we say, no, we're a family. We're a family. Then something happens. Maybe the person made a stupid decision and they need help. Oh, man, I, I, I wish I could help you. And then you're thinking of ways to allocate those resources somewhere else so you can claim that you're broke. Selfishness. We do this all the time with different things. We do this with money. We do this with time. Hey, I, I just, I feel weak right now. I need a little encouragement. Can, can we get together? For this window, oh man, I, yeah, if, if I have time, sorry brother, I couldn't do it because I'm spending time with these sons. And you give away your time so you don't have to spend that time on someone you don't want to really be with. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to discern if, if I'm being unclear or there's just a heavy weight about these things. Maybe it's a little both. What we're fighting to do is to be uh, free lenders, to give what the Lord has first given to us. But Laban is so caught up in wanting to be selfishly served, coming up with a solution that will help benefit him and his family, that he tries to give everything away. So his hope is when Jacob comes to him and says, Laban, can I take these? Oh, there are none. Sorry. They're all gone. So that Laban's flocks could increase and that Jacob would be at a detriment. He continues on in this pattern of self-serving, even with his sons. Yeah, so Laban takes the flock immediately after Jacob asks for it, and he agrees to it, and he gives it to his sons. Look at the beginning of 31, verse 1. It says, Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, 
Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has gained all this wealth. We didn't go into it uh, too much, but Jacob started taking this flock and was producing much gain for him from these sheep and from these goats. And here we have his brothers rallying against him, almost like picking sides, uh, which interestingly enough, just a few verses before that, they were given this flock from their father that was supposed to be Jacob's, and now they're here attacking and accusing Jacob of stealing from his father's wealth. You see this. And I wonder how his sons started talking about that. How did his sons pick up on that? How did his sons pick up on it? Because Laban was leaking it out. Part of the self-serving solutions that we try to come up with are getting people on our side. So conversations leak out. Hey, Dad, what, what, you seem off today. Are you okay, Dad? Yeah, just stuff going on. With, with what, Dad? Well, some things with Jacob. It, it's it's going to be okay. It's it's going to be okay. You know, there's, he took a, no, I've probably gone too far. Dad, tell us what's going on. Well, I hope I didn't have to tell you this, but, you know, Jacob, he's been working. He's trying to steal our sheep, sons, the sheep that belong to you, the ones that are that are yours. That it really seems by the fruit of his life, by the way he's acting, you know, I, I'm not the one who wanted to move three days' journey away. He, he moved three days' journey from us, and he wanted us to separate, so we were just trying to give him space, sons. And then the sons start talking. How many times has that happened when you're in a conflict with someone? That when people come over, you just try to leak out a little bit so that you feel like people are on your side of what happened. Yeah, there's just conflict going on with this thing. You know, I, I've tried my best. You know, they, they, it just stinks that they did this and then they did this. But don't, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm really trying to take the high road. That's exactly what it looks like. Self-serving, bringing people to your side. But see, there was a promise on Jacob's life that he would be blessed, and he was blessed. Like Patrick said, we didn't go into the, remember how the sheep reproduce. He throws these sticks in a trough, and they become fruitful, and they multiply. There's a bunch of different theories about how this happens. Miraculous, yes. There's actually a way through nutrients to change the genes of animals as well. All kinds of divine inspiration flowing around. And this part of the story that we're not going to get too involved in. But the fact is that God promised a man something, and Jacob didn't have to fight for it, but just had to walk with his God through it and trust his heavenly Father. And remember how this started. It's Laban welcoming him into his family. Hey, your family. And what, are we, what, is, what is it at now? It's a, uh, there's division. There's this rallying. There's not supposed to be sides in the kingdom, right? We're one body. And here we have this supposed family starting to get fractured more and more by these wedges. We're going to jump into the last one. In Genesis 31, 20, here is the last wedge we see. And we're going to break this down into a few parts. But it's fleshly responses. Fleshly responses. Choosing to respond in a way of our former life of sin versus how the scripture in, shows us how to respond. It says in verse 17 of chapter 31, so Jacob arose and, and set his sons and his wives on camels. He's like, forget it, I'm out of here. Jacob was walking the line, walking the line, walking the line. I think he was doing fairly well through this whole thing. And then he kind of gets to a point where he's like, I, I've had enough. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained, the livestock and the possessions that he had acquired in Padamaran to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear the sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. Not good. And Jacob tricked Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him that he intended to flee. It's crazy to think about, but one of our fleshly responses in conflict and something like this can actually be withholding information. Withholding information. I've been guilty of it. It says, if you look down in verse 31, Jacob answered, why did you do this, Jacob? Because I was afraid. We do that all the time. We want something to go a certain way. 
So we just go ahead and do something without asking the people who are around us in our life, our spouses. And I'm not talking about asking for permission. I'm talking about letting them into your life. You get it all settled. You get it all fixed. And then you tell about it after the fact. There are disciples who, when everyone was at church or in the middle of the night, have just grabbed their stuff and left. Why did they do that? I don't know. There were things going on inside them that they were trying to withhold. This is also seen when a brother or sister in the Lord, if you have a covenant relationship, you're fighting for unity together, and they won't open up about personal struggles in their own life, but just like to ask all the questions and turn it back on other people. No, just tell me about you. I don't want to open up about me. No, tell me how, how this person's doing. Or they try to place it in all other kinds of ways, but they will never open up freely withholding because of fear. That's where Jacob finds himself, withholding information because of fear. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 5, 4 through 6. It says, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? If we go to Genesis 31, 24, the Lord comes to Laban in a dream and tells him to be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Who here has grown up with parents that said, uh, if you have nothing nice to say, just don't say nothing at all? Yes. This is pretty much the Lord saying, <laughs> sometimes that the most spiritual thing for you to do is to shut your mouth. And, you know, I, I talked earlier about how I struggle to find my voice sometimes. It's funny that this is actually the Lord saying, yeah, you should be quiet. Right, there are times to be quiet. Laban obviously does not abide by that. And uh, it goes into this next fleshly response. Which is a victim mentality. Victim mentality. All right, let's see how Laban responds to this. In verse 26 of chapter 31. And Laban said to Jacob, what have you done that you have tricked me? Jacob, how could you do that to me? You tricked me and driven away my daughters like, like you did. <laughs> Why did you flee secretly and trick me? Again, you tricked me and did not tell me. Because I, I might have sent you away. Vague, right? I love this. I, I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourines and leers. I, I wanted to do, I wanted to have a going away party for you, Jacob. But you tricked me. It's like, Laban, what have you been doing to Jacob for 20 years? He became a victim in a moment. <laughs> this happens all the time. Harsh treatment, harsh treatment, harsh treatment from person A to person B. Person B responds in the flesh a little bit, does something that is also not right. But then person A tries to capitalize on what that person did instead of the bigger issue. Do you see that? Laban treating Jacob like garbage, tricking him, tricking him, doing all these terrible things. He gets to the point where Jacob says, yo, you changed my wages ten times, Laban. Laban did all these things for 20 years. Switching someone's wife is a pretty big trick, I would say. And then Jacob flees, but Laban makes it about him. You tricked me, Jacob. How could you have, have done that to me? We, we don't need to talk about what I did to you, Jacob. We just need to talk about that you tricked me, okay? That's the real problem here. What happens in the flesh, people become victims, and they actually make the lesser issue of what the person did greater than their issue so that they can just focus on this. 
It's like if, if Pat was like, hey, brother, I got to rebuke you because you did, you were doing this clearly against the word. And I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, no, I'm serious, brother. Pat, how could you raise your voice to me like that? I, I think, you know, you're in the flesh. Now isn't the time to talk about these things. I, I just can't believe you would speak to me. That The issue is with me. The issue is with me. The issue is with me. But Laban puts on a victim mentality. Victim mentalities in here have to be broken. My goodness. My goodness. Trying to bring up someone for responding in the flesh when you actually just don't want to deal with what you need to deal with. So you put the spotlight on them. Look at what you did. Look at what, no, you just did that now. And you make that the main point of everything. A victim mentality. Yeah. I'm Capitalizing on the way someone says something, blaming others for your response, believing that change won't work, victim mentality. I was just saying I'm convicted right now, man. I do that with my wife all the time. This, uh, she'll come to me and bring a correction, bring truth, and I, well, well you did this. Well, did, didn't you, when you said this, you, you know, this, that happened. Man, I'm convicted. Whew. Hey, man, you always want to see yourself as Jacob in this scenario of being a victim. You're Laban, straight up. You are Laban in this story. If you've, if you've been thinking this whole time, you know, I'm kind of like Jacob here. I've been, then you're, you are definitely Laban, okay? So if that was you, just own it. Just say, yep, nope, I'm Laban. All right, so the next fleshly response that we see is just plain anger. Anger in Jacob. Genesis 31, 36 says, Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, What is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? So we're looking at Lake. <laughs> no, you got to do it like you were Jacob. I, I, don't, I don't, okay, so. <laughs> I, I don't picture Jacob. I'm going to give, give Pat a chance to really express this in the fullness of how it should be. I don't think Jacob was like, what was my offense? Right? You think he's pretty fired up? You think the fuel of the fire of anger was going a little bit? All right, okay, okay. So in this scenario, I'll be yeah, Laban yeah. because I'm, I'm Laban, and you can be Jacob. What have I done? What have I done to you? How have I sinned against you? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I like that. So there's just three ways that uh, Jacob expressed his anger in this moment. He gets defensive. He starts to tally, keep a scorecard of all that he's done for Laban. Telling, hey, I've served you for 20 years. I've taken care of your cattle. You've seen increase with me. But he, then he also accuses in it. He says, you've changed my wages 10 times. And he, uh, that's one of the words for berate is this, this accusational in anger. Yeah, you can imagine things were pretty fired up. I, I, just, I, I just find this part of the story kind of comical. Have you guys ever seen uh, uh, What About Bob? When Dr. Marvin is, it gets mad at him when they're in the car. He's like, get out of the car! And he like, you can't even, you can't even make out what he's saying. That's, I picture that being a moment <laughs> like this. Then he starts just to go and tally everything. I did this for you. I did this for you. I did this for you. And I did this for you. You did this. You did this. You did this. And he's just running through the scorecard. I, I, I believe what Jacob said. It was the way he was doing it. He was building his own defense. God was his defender. God was his defender. God promised him all of these things things. But as soon as the challenge came, he felt squeezed enough where this is what began to come out of Jacob. Let's look at Genesis 31, 42 through 45. We're going to end on, this is the last fleshly trait that we see, and this is all coming from breaking words. It's that we double down on our position. We doubled down on our position. So 
so they go through this huge fight. Let's see where I want to pick up. Let's pick up in verse 43. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, the daughters are my daughters. The children are my children. You see how everyone's fighting for their own position? Those are mine. No, that's mine. This is mine. The flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these, my daughters, or for their children whom they have born? It doesn't say your wives. No, my daughters. Well, fine, I'll just do something for my daughter, Okay. Forget you, Jacob. I'll at least take care of my daughters. Come now. Let us make a covenant. You have to feel the tension that's going on in this text right now. Fine. You know what? I got to do what's best. Let's just, let's just make a covenant. Let's just do something, call it God, and then split from each other's lives. Get your God stamp out. God, okay, we're done. Look at it. Come now, verse 44. Let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and they made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha. Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha. But Jacob called it Galid. They can't even agree on what they are calling what just happened. Laban is speaking his language, Aramaic. Jacob is speaking Hebrew. And they become entrenched in their own position. Yeah, well, I call this season this. Well, okay, well, I'm going to say it like this. They doubled down on their position. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. This heap that they called God became a wall in between them. It became a barrier from them being able to get to one another. It wasn't saying, hey, we are choosing to reconcile at this heap. It's saying, you take your stuff and go over there. I'm going to take my stuff and go over here. And we are just going to live life that way. Too many times we have called something God, we put God's stamp on what we say is an altar when really it's a barrier. We say, oh, well, you know what? Seasons come, seasons go. Things change. That was a good season. You stay over there. I'm staying over there. God has clearly led us apart. God may be leading you into different seasons, but it's not like that. It's not like that. At the end of this, it says that Laban departed. Never any closure to the story. Never a moment of reconciliation between family. But there is a fracture that splits the rock open. You guys see the progression of this truly sad story. And honestly, it's the Lord's mercy on us that we can take these stories, learn from them, and do better. Right? We as a, as a people need to do better in these areas. Because ultimately, what started as a family ended up in walls, division, no longer together. And that's something that we, I personally have seen the effects of this type of behavior. Relationships, specifically within the kingdom. Because we're talking about a body of believers We're not talking about relationship with the world. We're talking about this body here. And these aren't just standards that we're we're adhering to uh, just to check a a mark off and be a good Christian. It says irreducible minimums, 
for a working relationship. What that's really saying is, uh, I was talking to Pastor Eric last week, and he was really hammering, maybe a better wording would be a productive relationship. This is, should be producing something in us as we adhere to these. Amen. We are not about to have the family be split among us because of our broken words. So why don't you stand with me right now? If you have been hanging on to a situation surrounding a broken word, today's the day for forgiveness. You have to let it go. Listen, I'm, I'm not saying like that this means all consequences are absolved. I'm saying that in your heart, you need to surrender it to the Lord so you can be made whole. We can't try ourselves harder into this. We can't. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind according to the Holy Spirit. Because this will naturally come out of us when we become more like Christ. Who lived out every word even to the point of death. You can't try harder to just do this. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to empower you so you become more like Jesus. If you were here this morning and you know that you've been hanging on to people breaking words to you and it has been a plateau in your life. You've been on a plateau. This, is the, this was the name of where Jacob was. The plateau of Aram. You're not moving forward in your walk with God. You're not moving forward in your relationships. You're not trending up the mountain into God's presence. You have plateaued. Because you have unforgiveness surrounding broken words in your life, would you just raise your hand? Amen. Amen. Now just begin in your heart. Just begin to offer up forgiveness. Just say, Lord, I forgive this person for breaking their word. I cling to you, God, who works all things together for my good because I love you. I can trust you. Lord, I pray that decades, decades of weight would be lifted right now in Jesus' name. Lord, that the fractured rock would begin to come back together right now in Jesus' name. Lord, that all the unknowns, all the future, and all the consequences would be entrusted to you. That a soul rest would come on now. If you are here and you know breaking your word, when you say yes, you don't do it. When you say no, you sometimes do it. You know this has been an issue in your life of doing and completing and accomplishing the very words that you have spoken out, that you're seeing it play out in your relationships. You're seeing the weight it's bringing into your marriage. And you say, God, I need to be set free from this. I need to be transformed. I want you to raise your hand. King Jesus, we want to be like you. Lord, we can't just try hard enough. Lord, I ask that by the power of your spirit, you would renew us. We renew our minds. God, even the things that we just forget about, I pray, Lord, that we would have a relationship with you where you would bring them back to our mind because you care about this. Your son was revealed as the word, and we want to shine forth like he did. Lord, I pray that we would taste of the fruit of doing the things that have proceeded from our mouths. God, that families would flourish because what we speak is what we believe in faith and what you are able to accomplish through us. That, God, we would begin to feast as families. 
as we live this out with one another. We just want to be like you, Jesus. We want to be like you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.